All right. Well, welcome everyone to the People Strategy Forum podcast. So we're a show that guides leaders on how to elevate the workplace. And we believe that people are at the heart of successful organizations. Team members' well-being, rewards, career development are all essential to happy and a healthy, uh, productive workforce. So this show discusses the practical and effective leadership strategies for top executives, senior professionals, and talent managers. So first, I'd like to, uh, uh, I'm sharing the, the the scene as a host today with Smit Singla. So welcome, Smit. Smit is a is a broadcasting out of India, and he is a uh, uh, he's known as the culture guy. He is Smith and I have written a book together on the workforce experience, and so I'm, I'm pleased to have him here on the show with me today. Today, we are diving deep into the transformative power of putting people first with Terry M. Eisner, a visionary in the realm of executive coaching and brand consulting. Terry brings to the table a rich tapestry of creative direction underpinned by core values like empathy, inclusion, and creativity. He believes that uh, it is crucial for organizations to, to have a, a people-centric approach to be effective in the, in the workplace. His expertise in marrying modern marketing techniques with a people-first approach has not only reshaped brands, but also has proven that prioritizing people in a direct path it creates a direct path to profit and success. So join us today as we explore with Terry how being a people-first organization can elevate your brand and your bottom line. Welcome, Terry. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. This is going to be a fun conversation. Yes. As, as we start out, um, what I would I would love to do is just learn a little bit of, uh, more about, uh, about you. I mean, how did you get into the practice of where you're at now? I mean, what, what, tell us a little bit about your life, Terry. Sure. Um, everybody grab your coffee and sit back. Um, so <laughs> it, it, where I am today was definitely um, not my strategy. Uh, it was kind of one of those paths and processes just happened. Um, we are a 22 person um, PR marketing branding uh, business development agency for lawyers and law firms specifically. So when the Supreme Court said it was okay for lawyers and, and law firms to begin to market themselves, um, Jaffe, our company was instantly formed uh, and instantly formed within within the law firm. Um, and it was formed by a gentleman who, um, Jay Jaffe, who created in our minds, legal PR, legal marketing. I joined the firm as the creative director and moved up and stayed alongside of Jay as an executive uh, vice president for many years. And he unfortunately died about uh, 11 years ago. Um, and at that point, the opportunity to either go back in house or step up to the plate and take over uh, a brand that I felt had um, great equity in the marketplace, considering in my mind, they created, you know, the the, the services that we, we have to offer today still uh, and uh, ended up stepping in uh, with two business partners um, and as CEO of our agency. Uh, again, I was a creative director. I was the guy who had on Pink Floyd and the lights were dark and I was doing ad campaigns and learning what websites were going to be like and, you know, figuring out how we promote, how we market and um, how we can be creative. And the next thing you know, um, I'm uh, uh, in charge of not only our agency, but I really think I've taken a lot on in how we change cultures of law firms, how we change the, the business models of the law firms um, and how we create a dynamic in which emotions and whole selves are welcome into a place that's so pragmatic and so black and white and so reserved. Um, so it's been a really interesting journey, but one I've enjoyed very much. And throughout that, I discovered that my platform really was about people uh, and not about business, but how if I focused only on people, the business would be greater than I could have ever envisioned it to be. And I'm believing that is exactly the secret sauce uh, that the legal community needs, especially when you have this equity-based format where you have a lot of people say that's involved basically through their money. Um, you don't get to the people first format so quickly. 
So, so what was the, the, uh, I guess the, the telling moment that really drove you towards creating more of a, a people centric approach in your organization? So we were virtual before, you know, virtual was really virtual. Um, so <laughs> when the pandemic came along and everybody was making sourdough bread and doing TikToks, we woke up the next day and it was still the same day. And we're like, oh, okay, wait a minute. What do you mean that everything is shut down? We work from home. <laughs> we do this. Um, and that dynamic right there is where it started. You know, you start to lose those things that we were given from the industrial revolution, you know, mentality of accountability, automations, um, you know, really being more micromanaged, having these expectations of being there and being there for a certain period of time. And maybe me as the employee, I think that's how I'm measured by showing up at 745 when I'm supposed to be there at nine and staying till 745 when I'm really allowed to leave at six or whatever that is. And when all that went away, and I really couldn't manage the day-to-day -day moment of a person, I had to put trust in those people. And then putting trust in the people changed a very different dynamic in the way that I had to manage and, uh, and lead. And it was a whole different dynamic because all of those things that we were taught about how business was supposed to be and how we button ourselves up and how we present ourselves was starting to go away because I didn't have those forms of measurement anymore. So therefore, it became measuring the person, gut instinct, relationships, being more curious and understanding who uh, I'm working with and how I can better relate to their situations, successes, failures. And it just added a lot more dynamics, but they were dynamics that I live every single day. So it was really easy to kind of apply them from a leadership role and how I could measure success. Mm -hmm. What, was there a, a particular, um, I mean, you mentioned that a lot of your people have been remote and they've been remote for a long time. And and a lot of the, the, the struggles that leaders have had over the years is really trusting people that are, are doing their, their work and being effective and engaging on, on a, a remote basis. So is, is there something that, that uh, you're doing that gives you confidence in, in that, is, is in your people? Yeah, I, I I did start to understand there's a dynamic that you have or don't have when it comes to working at home. That a sense of accountability, that um, the 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 need and want to not have to be managed to be successful. So you have to have those drives. And so when I go and pull somebody from an in-house position and bring them to our agency. And I have not vetted the idea that you can work alone, that you thrive in working alone, that you find innovation in working alone, or if you have these needs for collaboration, um, how could I provide those so they, you know, that you you can operate within those? It's usually those people that were coming out of an in-house situation that fail in our work environment. And I had to learn to vet that and really look and look for people and attract people to the culture that we had, to the business model we had. And what it turned out to be was predominantly moms. So you have these really professional, really uh, great experts at what they do, PR, business development, these things, things that fit within our uh, service offering. And you don't conform to nine to five. Um, and many of us don't conform. And the pressures and the things that we lose in life, and we value life so much more, that if we can find that way in which we combine our personal life and our professional lives and creating one brand that people can trust and gravitate to, you, you know, you, you, you find and align with those people that you can then begin to trust. Uh, you're here because of something that you provide. You're here because you value and you look at what this organization offers you from a work-life balance. So therefore, financially, you can see the differences where you need it from uh, dollars versus time. Um, you can be a mom sitting in um, the uh, doctor's office uh, and you're still fully connected to anybody and everybody by your phone. So you don't have these pressures and stresses that I'm gone, I'm missing, I'm not accountable. Um, and if you free these people to realize this and you free your team and your staff and you align with the people that can manage that themselves, then you start to get success in the idea of 
trusting in people, not trusting in a process. If I have a process, it's cookie cutter and I expect you to fit into my mold. If I have a problem and we collaboratively open up and let ourselves think about how to solve the problem together, then we probably find more efficient, more effective, even more infectious ways to succeed. That's putting trust in people. But I had to first bet the fact that you can actually manage this at home or in this environment that does not have accountabilities, water coolers, and collaboration on a day-to-day. Yeah, that's a good point. And in uh, really seeing if a person is going to be successful in that remote environment when they've never been there before. And I, which brings me up to to you, Shar. I mean, I, I know that you're you're a very social person. You love to talk and interact with people. I mean, but now you you are uh, you know, almost entirely remote and you have been for several years. Was it a big adjustment for you? Well, because I'm very social, <laughs> um, I think my biggest challenge was the technology side. Everybody knows that. I don't have a full IT department helping me. However, yeah, um, it has been an adjustment. I'm, I I think more for me, technology, microphone, all that. But uh, when I was running my company, um, I realized some of my challenges about being in that face-to-face contact. So I structured my company so that you know, my business partners and I would, would fly home in Colorado and do the face-to-face. And then I structured my meetings, my one-on-ones, my uh, talent management coaching, all of the things that I did so that my employees never felt that I had abandoned them. And quite honestly, many of my employees were all over the world and as well as, well, mainly the United States. Um, but if I could say one comment, uh, when I was a HR executive in healthcare, um, I did have many uh, departments like the coding department or the physician billing department. And, you know, we had a lot of real estate and healthcare system that was dedicated to the cubicles and mm-hmm. office seating. And, you know, even back uh, over a decade ago, I think it's been now, uh, I was always a champion about leaders really trusting your employees that employees can monitor themselves. And I have I had many of a light debate about well, how do I trust my employees are not looking at their phones all day? How do I trust my employees not playing uh, solitaire on their computer when they're supposed to be working? And a lot of people, I had leaders say, well, I know they're logging in, but they're really off, you know, uh, getting their coffee and taking the dog for the walk, but they're pretending to be logged in. And there's even a mouse thing now that actually moves your mouse around so that it yes. it looks like you're logged in. I I was like, oh, I didn't understand that. And, but however, I would always champion and say, it's about productivity, it's about outcomes, it's about, you know, really doing the job. And frankly, I don't necessarily care as long as they're not doing anything inappropriate from a company policy. But if an, if an employee's looking at their phone, if they're, as long as they're being productive, um, you know, and I, it's interesting because with the pandemic, and I don't work in that necessarily healthcare system anymore, but I'm curious, I may call some of my uh, leader colleagues and say, how are you adjusting now? Because remember those debates we talked about, about trusting your employees? I'm wondering how you're doing now with that because times have changed and uh, it's definitely made a difference. So hi, Terry, I'm Shar. I just crawled in from the beach. Hi, and, Char. But yeah, I think it's great. So what are your thoughts, Terry, about uh, the leader that's kind of resistant to trusting their employees and uh, how do you uh, coach that leader um, to to maybe have a paradigm shift in this day and age? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, if you do not have an Apple TV subscription and not watch Ted Lasso, then you're not doing yourself justice as a leader. It is a case study on how to be a leader today. Uh, you know, in every presentation I've ever given, I wish I had these case studies about culture and empathy and, you know, aligning emotions and letting them come to work. And then along comes Ted Lasso. And I'm like, oh, my God, every episode is just a case study of exactly how we should be as leaders. And it really just comes down to some of these core basics of, you know, of trust and curiosity and communication. And I think what happens as leaders is we just also do. And we forget that what we do then sets a stage of what's expected. So just because I might be somebody who absolutely enjoys working 24 seven, which I do not, but there are those people that really do thrive and work. And there really isn't a boundary in their mind 
to the idea of work. It's 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 equally, you know, it's pleasure to them to be able to focus and strategize and think and move things. And you communicate from odd hours and at different times and on different days. And all you're doing is setting these expectations and creating these anxieties to your staff, especially in a virtual dynamic in which you're not seeing and communicating. And there creates these really hard expectations. So one of the first things I realized was communication was critical. Transparency was critical. If you're going to do what I do as a model, then I needed to be as vulnerable. I needed to be the, the, the human example of how business was run today. That was really the trickier part because I've got two other business partners who are like, ah, I don't know if I'd say that. Ah, I don't know if I would do that. But I, I don't live that way. I live very much in the idea of understanding what you bring to the table, expecting that you're going to bring that to the table and then allowing you the freedom to bring that to the table. Looking at your phone during the day, according on what you do, you know, could provide you great insight, information. Yeah. There could be uh, updated to uh, a court ruling, laws, changes in that, yeah. natural disaster, whatever. Something happens. Creativity happens. You know, you're just stuck in TikTok. And the next thing you know, you've just solved an ad campaign, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Terry, just a, a final point here I want to say, because uh, you're absolutely right. And very highly intelligent people. Uh, I, I'm not saying I am, but I mean, my mind is always spinning and thinking constantly. And so if I'm like, you're absolutely right. What's the latest news? What's the latest statistics? What's the, the information that, that would really gain credit? Cause I research a lot and it was frustrating because when you're on a zoom call, you're looking at the little hole right there, you know, and you're like, you know, but sometimes we look down and we have something really important to interject with. Mm -hmm. And since my brain's constantly thinking about other things, I mean, I could be focused on the material and what I need to say if I'm able to look down briefly or pull up an article or look at my other screen and not looking eyeball to eyeball with my little hole at the top of my computer. <laughs> and yeah. it is really, huh? I was just going to say, it, 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 we have to... Technology is a barrier. Another thing that creates these dynamics of uncomfortable situations, anxiety, and a lot of working at home from my perspective is to eliminate anxieties, to gain time back, to gain your life back, to find more freedom, to, to create great um, uh, uh, service offerings, um, solve problems. Um, and, and the technology does, and I get frustrated as a leader when technology isn't working, because we're all operating from the same technology, but so many factors can affect it. And I think that enough of us, this was, again, another wonderful thing that came out of, of 2020, is enough of us were exposed to those issues that we've become numb enough to say, chill out, relax, technology happens. We understand that, you know, we cannot control certain things. And I think we're coming out of you know, a, a, a business mindset and philosophies where there was so much control, but we're losing control and we're opening it up. And I think by opening those things up, creating those cultures that are more relevant today, then, uh, you know, the dynamics are changing a bit and you're getting greater innovation and you're getting greater collaboration, even though there are barriers between us now and we're not even just offices away, but you have to, to kind of trust in that system. And the beauty of COVID is that it ripped this Band-Aid off. It ripped off this, right. this situation that said, tough, you're going to do it anyhow. Now, the real struggle is where those leaders who are saying, but I want some of that accountability. I think we we thrive better in-house versus out of house, or those who still are questioning the dynamic of what that means to have you know that sense of freedom. But I had to go back to what were my anxieties. I, I am not... That, that big corporate business leader who wants to work all the time and make all of this money. No, I want to live my life. I want to go scuba diving. I'm a painter. I want to spend time with my kids. My husband and I love to travel around the world. I want you to do that too, every day. Um, I try to travel and stay accessible because we love to travel to show that you can do that. But I realized I had to start really getting down to the nitty gritty of some of the things that were affecting us. 
You know, the idea that your pet has died is equally as stressful as anybody else dying in your life. You can't roll your eyes at the idea that I have to understand and create a dynamic in which that person has the ability to mourn. And I have to, because I feel that, I should allow others to feel that. And I think the biggest thing, the, the biggest win I have ever had as a leader was, you know, coming again out of uh, out of the pandemic and the whole sense of well-being and how well-being had such a part at the table. And um, and I realized that, and, and I became a, the co-chair of the well-being committee to the Legal Marketing Association because I just knew this mattered. We again had to change cultures and we had to change the events. We had to just change things. So people felt comfortable and um, and included. And I was just going through a really terrible time and never in my life have I ever experienced depression or sadness or anything that's affected me in a way that shut me down. But I ended up getting COVID. I was upset about the fact that I did. I was scared. I We did everything right. Other things were happening in a personally and I was in a bad place. I just was like, oh my gosh. So I sat back and wrote a letter to my entire company and I told them, you know what? It's okay to not be okay. And I'm not okay. I'm not okay for you guys. I'm not okay for me. So I'm going to check out of the game. I'm going to be gone for 10 days. You cannot reach me. Don't try. I will not respond. And I did. And I came back and I was just ready to go. I, I, I addressed things. But the outpour that came from my team was just unbelievable. I mean, as a leader, it just lifted me up in a way that I'd never been because I was vulnerable. And I told people, it's okay to be a human being. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to learn from mistakes. Um, and it changed a lot around here. A lot more people found the need. Empty nesters were really experiencing these things. And I was sensing them. Um, I'm, I'm a cancer. So I'm horribly empathetic and I can feel anything and everything. And I sensed this and I had to create a culture and a dynamic in which you had to put your oxygen mask on first. And if you did, then you can successfully help the rest of us. But if you didn't do that first, then you're no good to me. You're no good to the client. You're no good to your team. So that was a huge lesson for me to start to trust in people and trust in feelings and trust in emotion and create trust as a real sense of how we would succeed and how I would lead. Such wise words there, Terry. And I, I want to, uh, as you, you mentioned, one of the most important pieces as a, a leader that really made change in your organization was showing that vulnerability. And I want to go back to what you said a little bit of, uh, in the, the show, Ted Lasso. Uh, I, I was, I'm, I'm starting to watch that show as well. And, and Smith, I would love to hear from you because I know that you're a huge sports fan. Do you get Ted Lasso in India? We do. Um, although I haven't really seen the show yet. Mm. You it's will a, now. It's a, yeah, it's a good one. You should you should look at it. It's it's a, it's a good will. show. But you know, one of the things Apple TV subscription for that. Yeah. Sorry. I think I think you'll really enjoy it. One because you you your soapbox is culture, and you know there's a need to change a culture in here and change a dynamic of the way we look at something like sports and you know the masculinities and the expectations. But when you watch a person be vulnerable you watch a person be corny when you watch a person just be themselves and you watch a dynamic of change you know you can do this and like you you watch this and so whether it's optimism or curiosity or motivation or humor or vulnerability or even love these are things that mostly didn't fit in a corporate dynamic in our 80s and 90s you know uh, industrial mentalities but here these are what it, this is what it's about today. You know, diversity and equity and inclusion are so big in the way that that we should be operating. And um, and Ted Lasso just really gave you the ability to step back and say, I have the right to be me as a leader, and you have the right to be you on my team. And I would rather put value in my player than the results out on the field. And when you start to learn that, it changes the dynamic in your boardroom quite a bit. 
And so that, that, that's... Oh, go ahead, Smith. Sorry, so while I haven't uh, seen the show, but I've got a question that, uh, I mean, I know what the show is about. Um, do you think the lack of expectations from Ted and the and the fact that uh, essentially he's got all the luxury to fail in his role uh, helps him actually succeed? And maybe that's what uh, leaders should be doing more of. Uh, not hiring people with the intent of making them fail, but... Uh, I mean, just just not making failure a punishing experience like it probably happens with him. Yeah, there's actually one good episode that really deals with this. And there's a player who miserably fails on the field and, 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 and you know, they lose the, the match and um, people are very upset with him and he's very upset with the self. And, and I've used this in my presentations as an example. And, and Ted tells the player, you need to be a goldfish. You know, you, you need to move on from this. You need to learn from this and move on. And I think that's a big thing for us because we, we, we harbor these things. We hold on to them and they fester and they grow. And other people also hold on to them and harbor them and they fester and they grow as opposed to just letting it be a learning moment to say, hey, we learned something here, but we can move on from this. Um, too many times I've seen in business where somebody's made a mistake on a team and they've been canceled. Done. I'm not working with this person. You can't do that. You, We don't know the factors that happen that come into life every day. I have to remind people, we don't know if that's a, a, a mean person. We just, we don't know what happened on the way to work. Did they get a flat tire? Did they get bad news? Did they spill coffee all over the front of them? I don't know. So I can't project those thoughts. I just have to kind of welcome a situation and build from there. And I think that's one of the biggest lessons I did learn in this was failure is okay. I can fail as a leader and still be okay as their leader. They can look at me and go, oh, even Terry's human enough to have a typo um, in something he put together. Um, and I have to, the hardest part is leading others to take that deep breath and let that be a learning experience and then still have trust in a colleague. And I deal with that every day, even just recently. And that's a tough one because again, I'm projecting what I want onto somebody. And as a leader, what I'm learning is to stop projecting and just to allow to happen. And then it is hurting cats. You're hurting emotions, you're hurting thoughts, you're understanding dynamics. And when you put a team dynamic together, a good leader should understand all of those things. I understand there's a sick baby involved in this one. And I understand this one's been traveling for me and is tired. And I understand the client is beating up this one. Now, all of those emotions are coming to this meeting. I'm aware of this. So now I have to let it happen. And I have to trust in the fact that you all are either allowing your process to happen. And in the end, we're going to get to where we need to get. Because I didn't dismiss those emotional factors that are coming to the table today. Well, I, I, I can say one thing. I, I, it was a lesson for me too, as the ch uh, chief people officer and owner of my own business. I, an example is I had an employee uh, and her husband that both work uh, for my same company. And we had a location in Texas that was opening up and, you know, she would have had to, you know, move and sell all her stuff off and her mother-in-law was going to move with them. But there was some kind of miscommunication between the CEO and the, the employees about the moving budget, right? So we thought they were only going to have 10,000, ultimately it was going to be 12,000, you know, just some kind of miscommunication. And then I really began to reflect because she was kind of the primary person coordinating the move. And then she was afraid to talk to us about her real concern about the financial impact of this move. And I had to hear about it through my director. Thank God my director had a close, tight relationship with her. And then I reflected, like, what are we doing that this, this manager is feeling such anxiety about talking to us about her concern about the cost of her move? Because I was like, I thought I was creating that open HR with a heart, which is my motto. I, I felt I was creating that culture for my employees, but somewhere in the CEO dynamic and this manager, she didn't feel safe enough to really talk about what's going on. 
And I lost sleep over that because I'm thinking she's literally picking up her entire house, selling everything and moving to Texas. No offense, Texas. It feels a lot different than Colorado. <laughs> but it, yeah, I agree with you 100%. And one last comment I'll say is also you have to think about the wage and hour implication because when I was a leader addicted to my BlackBerry, yes, I'm a BlackBerry girl. Uh, I, you know, I was available 24 seven. It'd be nine o'clock at night. My leader had a crisis. Blah, blah, blah. You know, I was constantly, now I was salary, but then the problem was my hourly employees don't have the freedom of just responding to emails, texts. And then we had a huge wage and hour audit because we, I mean, luckily we were able to work through it, but we weren't thinking about the 24 seven access so it's really important that we allow our, our employees and leaders too to have that downtime for weekends and yep. not be on the clock 24 seven because some of us are BlackBerry addicts or smartphone addicts today. And um, so there's a lot of HR implications too that you really need to evaluate about setting up that culture. Yep. Yeah, I go back to, again, what we do as leaders, you know, I talked about it from a well-being perspective and I think what I was also trying to say and I want to make sure it was clear is just because I operate a certain way doesn't mean I expect you to operate that way. But if I don't articulate that, if I don't discuss that with you, you will always think that you, this is how I operate. Therefore, you should operate. And I think what we forget as leaders sometimes is to talk about those certain things that, that we do that might affect others. We just think we're a leader we're going to do. But there's ramifications in the fact that because I do something some way, it puts anxiety and stresses and expectations on people when they shouldn't be there. But we don't realize we're doing that. And, you know, I think it's that's an important part to step back and say, as a leader, I'm a human being and I have a family and I have uh, hobbies and I have all of these things that I need to do on a daily basis. Plus, I have this to do. How does this all fit in and how can those working with me trust they're going to get what I get? And how can I do it my way? And that's a really hard thing to give everybody, right? How are you going to do it your way, though there are still expectations and there, there are still ways into this work. And yes, there's still anxieties. And yes, there's still accountability because you're working with a team. And yes, you have a client, but I'm telling you to try to do it freely. What are you telling me to do, Terry? How, how do I do this? And it, it is a struggle. And I say this because not everybody can lead this way. Not everybody can work on teams this way and i understand that but in my mind this is where we are going in businesses in general whether you're spinning off and creating your own because it should be or you as a corporate america somehow drank the right kool-aid and you're you're doing this um so it's not like we're creating something that's a trend in any way humanity's not a trend it's just really come together for us and a lot of this is also generational. Let's just throw one more mix in this. You know, there's five generations in the workforce right now. And the dynamics between each one of these is really very different. Um, and so when we apply mentalities from Gen X and boomers, you know, downward, you're you're just creating a battle for yourself. So how do I, you know, as a leader, um, uh, you know, in in uh, and one of the older generations as a Gen Xer say, hey, how do I appeal to alphas and others? Because what's going to happen is your business that you're working with one day is going to have the younger person on the other side of the table. You're going to bring the older person still to the table. And now there's no alignment and no adjustment. So it's just from my mind, it's greater than even leadership. It's just looking at the world, looking at people and realizing that every email I send goes to a human being and every text that you read is a human being, every tweet, every thing, there's somebody on the other side. It's not technology. It's not a phone. It's not a wall. It's not a screen. It's a human being that is affected in some way by what you have put out there. And if I can just keep reminding everybody every day that there's nothing robotic about life, and that if we can bring those experiences comfortably, again, trusting the ultimate goal here in the end, the end result, working together as a team to provide a solution to somebody who needs it, I don't care where you are. I don't care how you get to it. I don't care if your sweet spot of working is 1045 at night until 2 a.m. I don't care. What I care is that I'm going to get unique, innovative, 
out of the box, good timing, you know, good timing, good results and hit the mark. That's all I ask of you. Right. And that's hard for a lot of people to accept that I've given you that much freedom to succeed. But when they all fall in line, it's all success. You win awards, you have profit, you have growth, you attract more people. And I fully believe that is how we will increase profits is within our people. Well, it's clear well, I when I oh, go ahead. <laughs> so I was just going to say it's clear when I go to your your website there, Terry, that the the, the Jaffe website that it it reports out that you've been successful in doing this for uh, your your organization as well as others. I mean that you're you're in primarily in the the marketing and PR business for legal companies, and so can you tell us a little bit about how you have. Uh, coach them to adopt a brand that is people centric in a way that is that is helping them attract the right talent to their organization. Yeah, I, I, it. The first thing I've ever done in helping write a ship's culture is tell them to go down to the mailroom, go down to the lowest positions that you have available. Not your rainmakers, not your executives, not your executive committees. Go down to the people who are running your organization every single day um, and start there because that's where the culture is. And that's where you start to understand where the cultural problems are. And so if you can tap into the real people that are really there with those anxieties, dealing with those situations um, because they don't have the luxury of being the executive, they don't have the luxury of being the rainmaker, um, that's where it starts. So when I can get a managing partner or an executive committee to understand that, if you look at it from a, a law firm's perspective, um, you know, people don't really hire the brand, they hire the lawyer and the relationships with the lawyer. So the lawyer has a lot of power to be to retain that lawyer because of the clients. But the same way that you do business development to get more clients or to get more customers, the law firm has the opportunity to bring in a new lawyer with a book of business, but you've got to create a culture that attracts that lawyer. So you've got to start to understand what is it that I'm looking for out of people? What type of culture do I need to retain these people um, and, um, and or attract these people? And a lot of it for me also says, are you spending time to even understand your client's boardroom talk and how they're operating? Because a lot of times the clients are way ahead of the law firm. So therefore their expectations of social commitments and culture and diversity at a table, et cetera, they're ahead of it. And the law firm's a bit behind because of their dynamics and the way they work. So, you know, the, the way that I try to get them to understand a culture is what is the 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 what's happening at your client and how do you walk the walk and talk the talk to them so again there's alignment how do you find a way to listen not to those that are in your meetings every day but to those that are supporting the success the real uh ones behind success i believe in an organization what is it that they're lacking and what do they need and then i think that's where you can start to develop what you can do to alter and change your cultures. I work in an industry that's very set uh, set up to uh, communicate hierarchy. So the corner office, the corner office, and the corner office, and the corner office, and the big you know um, cocktail events and stuff. Well, if you neutralize all that and all those corner offices become common areas, and you change a dynamic of an office space, and you alter the obvious. Um, uh, uh, hierarchies, you begin to change a dynamic instantly within those walls that seem so much more collaborative. Again, that's what 2020 did because the same managing partner is sitting in his bedroom having a Zoom call as the assistant is having in her bedroom having the call because we didn't have an office space. So we're seeing into people's homes and the kind of you stripped away a bit of that hierarchy sense and we all kind of became more human. That's usually where I start. You know, where where can we tap in to where it really matters? And where it really matters to me is those people doing the work on a daily basis to have the expectation of being set at their desk. That's where we begin to alter culture. I see that as, as super powerful. And, and just uh, uh, working with uh, Smith and Shar here, I've gotten to know uh, uh, Smith's, uh, his cats and then and Shar 
and drugs and, and so forth. And so it's, it, it brings a, a dynamic of not just equality and fairness, but that humanity and uh, that we uh, are always thriving and trying to have a, a greater relationship with, you know? So I think that uh, this has been a good uh, evolution in the work environment for sure. I'll tell you a simple story where we connect on this. Um, and I'll be real quick, Char. Um, I have a really great client that I love uh, and she's a pilot. Um, well, she became a lawyer because she wanted to buy a plane because she wanted to be a pilot. So I love her story. It's like, I only became a lawyer because I had make enough money so I could buy a plane and I can fly around. And I tell her story all the time and I created these really incredible videos like a a Netflix series that, you know, her from a pilot and, and you know, uh, um, uh, a woman in power and, and leading a firm and being an intellectual property in Detroit and these kind of, you know, really great things. And um, I was just nominated for something and I needed, um, they needed somebody else to, to, to add a comment. So they reached out to her and she said, I was at a, a, a conference and I saw Terry talk but what it was, was his stormtrooper sticker on his computer that made me say, I like that guy. I'm going to get to know that guy and we're going to we're going to work together. And she's one of my most successful clients. But it happened because I was comfortable enough to go to a conference, stand on the stage, let my computer tell you the story of everything about my life um, and connect on a very different level, not on a level of what I was preaching that day, not on a level of. Um, any of of you know my 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 past history of success or anything we connected on a human level something that we both agreed on and that started our relationship so i just i i want to say i'm looking at our meeting notes here and you know building that brand reputation and and changing the leadership mindset is e extremely critical um doesn't it feel better when you go into a uh, organization even these big box organizations you know, and, you know, they appear happy, they feel, you know, you feel that warmth, that love, that kindness. And when you talk about branding your reputation culture, I think oftentimes operationally, we, we have the departments that do all the branding and the marketing for the company. And we're the, you know, the best company out there, but really it's our number one asset, which is our people that really be, need to be the number one branding and rep, reputation because employees do go out there and say to their uncle, to their sons, their their daughters or whatever, their cousin and their neighbor, you know, I work at XYZ company and the culture is so bad and I am having anxiety every time I drive into work. I call it the, the white knuckle syndrome and that gets out there. And, and people go, I would never want to work for that company. I would never want to work for a boss like that. I don't want to work with a company that doesn't even allow me to work remotely on a hybrid system or whatever it may be. So, uh, Terry, when you talk about branding and really marketing your, your culture, I mean, obviously in the, in the job description or the job posting alone, you can mention that you know, yes, we have a great culture, this and that, people-centric, this and that, but a lot of people don't know what the word people-centric means. But what are your feelings about helping your employees really promote working for this organization? Because what I said to my employees, wouldn't you help us recruit people like you that have the same value system that we do? And I would like you to be involved in the recruitment process and maybe get a, a recruitment bonus or a referral bonus or something like that. So what's your thoughts about really engaging your employees in that process to attract the right culture and to exemplify that culture to our customers or, or our clients? Well, there's two answers in that. One is incentivize. So I, okay. I, will, I, will, I will give you something if you bring in that great person. And, but I have to create the culture in which you're comfortable in bringing them to. And um, you know, that was my challenge, which I believe I've succeeded in. So it really isn't something I could ask you to do. I can incentivize you. But if it's not real, if it's not authentic and organic, you're not going to market and sell it to bring anybody else into this. And our agency had a not a great reputation um, with the previous owner um, and working for. So part of me knew that I had to change that dynamic of the brand. I was going to hold on to the brand equity of the company's name. That made a lot of sense. My ego was not going to get involved and I wasn't going to change it. Smart enough there. 
But I also realized there was a reputation issue that had to be fixed, had to be it's critical. Um, and at that point, probably would not have had the recommendations of people wanting to come work with if I didn't change the dynamic of the culture to be people centric, to understand that the, the way that we operate and the expectations of those are very different than other corporate you know, businesses. And so once I figured out some of those things and I was able to start to write that, I saw that more people and more people were bringing more people and opportunities to the table. Um, I hired, you know, somebody had asked us who was a consultant to come in and speak to the law firm they were working with. Consultant, never met her before at all. Um, she wasn't even in the meeting because she was a consultant and they didn't even invite her to the meeting, which I thought was weird. I met her afterwards. We had coffee and I hired her on the spot. Um, and she is one of my biggest champions today. Young mom, going through a lot, told her about the environment, what we had, what I expect. She came in, she revamped a department for me. She's doubled it alone by, by simply living up to those things that I said that we did as a culture. The funny part of that, when you go back to me talking to other leaders and helping them uh, change the culture, the right things to say, the right things to do, taking your values off the wall, living them, showing this, you know, through all of your marketing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We were in a meeting and he said, Terry, you know, we just were talking to this new recruit and I was just about to talk about our culture. And he said, now don't start going down this road about your culture and your culture does this and your culture does that and your culture awards this and your work-life balance. Because I've heard it from all of them. And the managing partner said, I just sat there for a moment. I'm like, I didn't know what to say. I mean, I, I'm i following a lot what you taught me. Those were exactly the same things that I wanted to tell him. He said, so I decided to get up and take him and show him. And that was it. And that was it right there, right? We can talk about these processes and these beliefs and, you know, we can champion uh, Black Lives Matters or Black history or women's history. And we can have women's initiative things on our website but people are going to call BS on you today. That's the world that we live in. We're not authentic. We're not organic. So, you know, I talk a lot about you can't create a culture and it not be the culture. Or you're going to fail miserably. But he succeeded because he took this, 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 this person around and he showed them as opposed to listed it. And of course, they hired him. And um, I think that's a really important thing for us to remember and to understand that I will create salespeople. I will create champions for what we do. I will create followers to believe in me. I'll do all these things if I believe in them back and create a dynamic which they can succeed in. And we, we just purely have success. Yeah, there's hiccups along the ways, typos, mistakes, sure, things happen. But other than that, we have a really strong working environment. We have great collaboration, great innovation, great communication. And then in the end, really, you know, great solutions and successes. But that really has to happen by, again, going back and being vulnerable and recognizing where you have failures in your culture and adapt to those changes. And it's the only way that as leaders we can succeed. But also the other side of that is, hey, leaders, if you're not making the adjustments to attract, succeed, to be relevant today, yeah. And you, the employee, you're not in the environment that allows you to thrive and to grow and to be who you are. Get out. You know, don't feel you're stuck in these situations, you know, based on, again, the same mentalities that we've been put on by our parents of you have to have this paycheck and you have to do this. And yes, bills have to be paid and other things have to be done. But you can be a happier, more successful person if you're at the right culture and the right environment. And I think that's become our biggest measurement. And if leaders do not realize that's how they're being measured today, shame on you. That's the due diligence that's being done before they come to join your company. Well, it's, uh, it's I know that we're, we're running out of time here, Terry, and it's, in, it's been a wonderful conversation. The, the, the amount of uh, wisdom that you're bringing us is, is substantial for our listeners. So thank you so much. But uh, Thank you all. As we're we're wrapping up here, I mean, when we're thinking about the the key messages that you want our listeners to to really uh, take home and understand as far as how to uh, build their brand 
how to uh, attract and, and retain the best people for their, their organization. What are the things that uh, you would like them to keep in mind? From a leader perspective or anybody in general, there are three things I think that if we can just apply and practice that we can apply this on autopilot every day. It's just simply be a good person, first and foremost. Just, just be a good person. The other is respect others. Just don't judge at all in any, in any form. And if you can just not judge, show respect and trust, and simply be a good person, you're already changing a dynamic very easily. Those are three simple things that we can do. Um, you know, treat others with dignity, respect, um, do what is right always, inspire folks to succeed. Those are the all the things that that just from human nature we should be doing. That is humanity. And if we're dealing with people every single day and we're not just standing on a line creating a widget, that's my job is just a widget. I need my machine to operate every day. I have a quota. That's not really the case in most cases in business. So again, how does this affect uh, each and every one of us? So at the end of the day, just as a leader, be a good person. As a human being, be a good person to your colleague and anybody next to you and have respect and trust. And, and from Ted Lasso, have curiosity, ask questions, get to know your people. I have found people to be more valuable to me for things I didn't know and I found out because I was curious than what I actually hired them for in the first place. And I think that's where we get really short-sighted as leaders and as people. Thank you, Terry. So for, for our listeners that want to learn more, that want, that, that want to reach out to you to, to, uh, to understand some more of that wisdom, uh, what are your recommendations for them? Well, you can find a lot of the articles and, and things that I write and my colleagues write uh, on, at jaffepr.com. But if you want to follow me anywhere in social media, I'm sharing TMI. Uh, and TMI is for my initials. So um, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me um, in TikTok, anywhere you want. And uh, it's sharing TMI. Great. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in to the People Strategy Forum. And we'll see you next week. Take care. Terry. Thank you all. Thank you, Terry.